Hello, and welcome to another uh, Fission Tech Talk. Uh, today, we are doing an overview of Willow, uh, a protocol specification for local first key value stores which sync the best parts, fine grain permissions, destructive edits, and deletion without leaving metadata behind. I will hand it over to the Willow team to introduce themselves and uh, run their presentation. Please do hold questions to the end and feel free to use the chat. Thank you very much. Take it away, guys. Hello there. Um, we are. We are. I, I'm. I'm Sam Quillam, and uh, my my colleague and friend here is Alyosha. We're we're working on the Willow protocol for the last couple months. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I used to work at the UN, building interactive tools for learning about um, crimes perpetrated in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, in a case of complete total tonal whiplash. Um, I'm also the maintainer of a very popular typewriter effect library. Um, and then also for the past sort of two and a half years, I have been the, uh, the full-time maintainer of the Earthstar project, which um, this project is derived from and maybe some of you are familiar with. Hi, uh, my name is Ayosha, and I have insider knowledge about the fact that there are indeed slides to this talk which I think Gwil was supposed to share while we present. There, that's us. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm also a doing a PhD in computer science and uh, have been involved in the distributed space for quite a while, uh, originally with the Scuttlebutt protocol. And then I joined forces with Gwil. How long ago was it actually that we started on Willow? Uh, March. March, I'm pretty so sure it is. Roughly half a year ago. And now I don't know what else to say because... Okay, but that's that's okay because um, I have to quit and reopen um, Zoom to, uh, <laughs> to, to grant um, access to my screen. So um, I'll, be, I'll be back momentarily. Uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is going well. This is going great. Goodbye. Good. Um... Yeah, we were very, uh, uh, Fission's very first uh, in-person company meetup happened in Fernie, BC, in a small skiing town in February 2020. And we had um, uh, Rabble uh, was one of the people who dialed in and uh, walked us through a little bit about uh, SSB and Earthstar uh, principles. Um, I'll make sure to grab that link. Uh, I really loved some of the things that... Uh, or Star had to say about the sort of des design principles. Yes, and we will have design principles in our talk. Amazing. <laughs> Hello. Uh, who are you? It's me. <laughs> I'm the one who had everything set up correctly the first time. Um, this <laughs> we, we we work on this great protocol called Willow. Um, this is this these are the little cartoons of us. Hello. Um, and this is the description that um that Boris very kindly um, anticipated from earlier when we were saying, what's, what is Willow? What is Willow? <laughs> um, so um, let's start with um, kind of like some high level stuff, which is I'm um, just talking about the kind of like the zoomed out view of this protocol. So Willow is a, a family of protocol that, that comes in layers. We have a core data model, which is in green here. We have a sync protocol that you can use to synchronize this data model in, in orangey yellow here. And we also have a capability system in purple here that you can use with it too. You can mix and match with these things. You can use all of them. You can just use capabilities. You can just use sync. You're always going to have the data model, but um, you, can, you can essentially pick and choose um, depending on what you're building. Um, and I guess to that point, this is also a protocol that you build things with rather than that you adopt. So um, how does, so like you, do, you don't really write something um, using the Willow protocol and now you can talk to all the other things that use the Willow protocol. Instead, it's a building block that you use to build your own protocols that are then of course able to speak to each other. Um, but there's no kind of like single huge Willow universe. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, and, and, and the other thing, sorry, another thing that we need to sort of preface this with 
is a lot of protocols, when people talk about them and think about them, they're married to ideas of data structures. And Willow has no data structures that are absolutely implied within its protocol. Instead, there are data structures which are recommended, um, which make things easier and more efficient. But if you just want to keep everything in a array in memory, hey, you can start there and, uh, and, and work up from that point. So we're going to talk about the, the four things that we wanted most of all with this protocol. And those are resilience, as represented by tiny sprouts coming out of a tree trunk that's been um, from a tree that's been chopped down. Um, deletion of data, as symbolized by the, um, the pencil eraser. Partial sync, as shown by a slice of pizza. And access control, as shown by um, enormous keyhole in a door. Let's start with resilient networks in higher res here. Um, so essentially, what we want with our networks um, is dependency, we want it to not have a dependency on external infrastructure, right? Like, uh, I think this is where we're all starting from. Um, no one wants to lose access to data when something outside of their control fails. And of course, failure is a gradient. Um, and I think it really helps for us to think about it from the extreme end. So rather than thinking about you know, the situation of GitHub servers being down for the afternoon, I think we should imagine the inverse situation where instead access to the internet only comes along every few weeks or months. Um, fast internet access is ubiquitous for us here today, but I think it's optimistic to imagine that it'll stay that way. Um, and if you think that's very p pessimistic of me to think that way, then I have very good news. Um, by designing around the worst case, we easily handle the not as bad case, right? Um, and this is this very defensive design mode is one that we apply broadly to Willow. Um, and I think it's served us very well. Um, so yeah, long lasting partitions are a very important case for us to handle. Um, so concurrent editing of data is something that we built into Willow at the lowest level. And Alyosha will now tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so if we want to be able to independently do work on our data in a network partition, but we still want to synchronize that to other people afterwards, or we can, the best we can really do is to essentially record all operations and then just share them with other people and then in some way determine the composite state from that. So essentially what CRDTs are doing, Willow at the heart of Willow is just a giant CRDT in some sense. And so what does that mean? I'm from the Scuttlebutt background where the core idea was that everyone keeps appending data to their own individual data log and that gets synchronized eventually. But if we want to assume that we want um, multiple people edit the same data concurrently and there might be partitions, then we cannot really assume something like linear structure on all the data. We have to assume that in the worst case, everything is just happen happening under partitions. So we just get updates with no causal relation between them. So if we want to keep track of all the changes and then synchronize those around, the best we can do, well, yeah, the thing we should plan for is to just synchronize arbitrary sets without any real causal structure on them. So what's at the heart of an, uh, of an efficient implementation of all of this is a set reconciliation algorithm. That just means two peers can connect, they each have their sets of data and they talk to each other and at the end of it, they both have the union of the two sets, just all the stuff. And the trivial algorithm is to just send everything over to the other side, but that gets very expensive, of course. You, you ideally would only like to send these things, the things over that one side has and the other side doesn't. And we are using an approach for doing that called range-based set reconciliation, for which we have a slightly schematic drawing. <laughs> And the basic idea is the following. If I have all the data I want to synchronize with you, let's say, for example, we just have letters, characters from A to Z. 
what I can do is I can collect, um, I can compute a hash, a fingerprint, over all the letters that I happen to have. And then I send them to the other side saying, well, from A to infinity exclusive, uh, all the stuff I have in that range gives the following hash. And I send that over. And the person who receives that then sees, okay, they sent me something from A to infinity, so I'm going to compute the hash of all my stuff from A to infinity. They compute the hash. And in this example here, these hashes do not match. So they know, okay, we are not done yet. We need to um, do further work. So what the other person then does is they say, okay, I have all my data from A to infinity. And where do I need to cut it if I want to have half of my data in the first half and half of my data in the second half? And they might have A, B, C, and X, Y, Z, or in that example. They might have A, B, C, and D, Y, Z. And in that case, they would say, okay, I'm taking everything from A to D exclusive and from D to Z exclusive. So they're splitting based on their data and they're splitting their data in half to obtain two smaller ranges. And then for each of those ranges, they again compute the fingerprint over all the da data in that range. And they send that over together with the boundaries. So they would say, okay, from A to D, I have the following fingerprint. And from D to infinity, I have the following fingerprint. And this, the two peers can just iterate. So suppose the first peer also has A, B, C. So that's everything they have from A to D. So they compute the hash and it's actually equal. So they say, okay, this range we have already successfully reconciled without exchanging any actual items. Whereas for the other ranges, they might still see, okay, there's differences, they split again. And at some point they say, well, we're still different, but there's not enough data to split anymore since I'm just going to send you my data. And you reply with everything else in that range. And that's the very basic idea of how we efficiently enough uh, handle this case of saying, well, we're synchronizing unordered sets but we're doing it in a way that doesn't cost uh, absurd amounts of resources. So that's the gist of it. There's still one problem with it, and that is we need to compute those hashes of those ranges in the first place. And it would be kind of sad if we had to iterate over a full set for the first hash. And then if we split it at some point, the other person gives us a, a split point. Now we need to compute the hash of the first half and the second half. We would again have to iterate over all the data in total. And iterating over all the data in every step, not a good idea, too costly. But thankfully, we can use some clever data structures to speed this up. So imagine for a moment that instead of computing actual hashes, we would just count the number of, the number of items. That's, of course, a very bad way of determining whether two sets are probably equal or not. Um, but just uh, in principle, if we used that, then here's a technique for efficiently computing the, uh, the number of items, so the thing we use as a hash, for arbitrary subranges. Uh, so first, we take the data we have, and we just arrange it in a sorted sequence. And we use those items as the leaves of a tree. So we put a binary tree on top of that. And in every node of the tree, we store the number of items or the number of leaves in that subtree. Right? So if you look at the number seven there, the seven has seven leaves below it eventually. And that's how we build this tree. And the tree we put on there is just an arbitrary binary tree. We could have put another arbitrary binary tree on there. It doesn't really matter. So we're not forced, we're not locked into some precise Merkle construction. And now suppose, now suppose I wanted, like my peer told me, hey, I need the hash for everything from B inclusive to H exclusive. That's the cue for the next slide. So we need the hash for all of this. Or in our example here, we just want to count the number of things in this. Then how does this tree help us? There clearly is no single node that just tells us that there are six items in this range. But what we can do is we can look at the roots of the maximal trees that are fully within this range. That's again the cue for the next slide. <laughs> so if we look at these, right? So the highlighted vertices, those are the vertices that are highest up in the tree so that all their children are within the interval. And if we add those numbers up, we get exactly the number of uh, items in this range. And then now this works for counting things. So all we need to do is we need to find a hash function where we can also apply this sort of tree. 
And it turns out that this uh, tree works, this tree approach works whenever the data that you accumulate, you accumulate it with an uh, associative function. So it doesn't matter like A plus B plus C is the same as A plus B plus C. So all we need to do is we need to find a hash function with that property. So for example, we can just hash our individual items using SHA-256. And then, so that would give us the hash of a one item set. And then the hash of a range would just be the XOR of all the, the individual SHA hashes in there. And this you can maintain in a tree. And this way we can efficiently compute the hashes that we need for set reconciliation. And that's how we can justify just saying, well, we are syncing sets of unstructured data that gives us that we can independently work uh, in partitions that still allows for efficient sync. And don't worry, this is by far the most technical that the presentation will get. <laughs> Thank you, Alyosha. Um, yes, so that, that is how we sort of, that is how we have, like that is how data structures within Willow and how we synchronize it. And it also opens up a lot of other features for us in this protocol. Um, one of which is very powerful, um, partial sync. Now, for us, partial sync is really about um, inclusion, right? Because dealing with more data incurs more resource usage. Computers need to work out what to transfer. Uh, they need to transfer over possibly long distances. And then they actually have to save it somewhere. Um, and the more resources you have to use, uh, the more people are excluded from participating in the curation of that data to begin with. Um, and we really want this to be an inclusive protocol, which doesn't require optimal hardware or network conditions. So, you know, we want it to be able to work on old smartphones. We want it to be able to work on browser apps. We want it to work on microcontrollers, right? Um, and handling microcontrollers is actually something that I've doubted many times and I've asked I was like hey do we really do we really have to do this um but again by uh by dealing with the extreme case uh we have many tools to accommodate the the, the more common ones um so we want to reduce the amount of data that peers have to deal with how do we do that well time for a technical deep dive mm. also some pizza I'm hungry now um so here's a very simple way of doing it. We can already uh, synchronize arbitrary sets. So how about we just tell the other person, well, I only care about um, items that involve pizza. No, I shouldn't do that, that's confusing. But only, only data that involve cats. And then, so the other person tells me, I only care about cats. So I go through all my data, find all the cat things, and then put that into a separate set. And then I say, well, here's all my cats. Now you have your cats. Let's do a set reconciliation with the approach we just described. That would work, but it incurs this filtering step where again, we have to walk over all the data uh, before we can do any actual synchronization work. And we're trying to avoid that because microcontrollers and other stuff. A separate approach would be to just pre-compute the set of all things that have cats in them so that we're prepared for that particular query. But unfortunately, there might be very many possible queries, and then it isn't feasible to pre-compute those sets. So what we were looking for was a compromise where we maybe restrict the kind of queries that can be made, but uh, on the bright side, that we might be able to efficiently compute the fingerprints that we need for range-based set reconciliation or from a single data structure so that we don't need to recompute a new data structure from scratch. And it turns out that, when, that we can actually allow for fairly expressive uh, queries while still achieving that, and that is uh, through allowing range queries. So in our example, where we just synchronize individual letters from A to Z, someone might tell me I want everything from G to X, and that's the query, that's partial sync. They're not asking for everything in the set, they're just asking for a certain slice of that, a certain subrange. But that alone is, that alone is a bit restrictive. What uh, really becomes uh, more interesting is when we allow for multidimensional queries. Right? If we had a set of, I don't know, books, we might want to query for all books whose length is between 50 and 100 pages. 
but also uh, that were written by authors, starting with a with letter between M and, and Z. And that will be fairly expressive, and that's the model we adopted for Willow. Now, uh, to be precise, we allow uh, filtering or querying in three separate dimensions, which are the cornerstones of uh, our data model. And those are the time at which an entry was created. So entries are our atomic unit of data. We record the creation time. We record the subspace, which for now, that just pretend it said author there. So who actually created this data? That's kind of what the subspace is. And the last one is the path. And the path is user-defined. So any piece of data you put into Willow, you give it a path of which you can think like a file system path. Right? So I'm, I'm writing the number 42 to slash user slash Ayosha slash favorite number. And this is how you would design apps. You essentially write your, your um, data to meaningful paths. You would have a path for, for chess games. And below that, you would have individual moves or individual games. I don't know. That's for application developers to decide. Right, so the path dimension is the one that the application developers have uh, a lot of control over. And then time and who wrote it, those are just recorded as it happens. And with this, we can uh, do three-dimensional queries. We can ask for everything that Gwil wrote last week uh, below his slash chess path, right? So um, if we do ranges and paths, we can, uh, we can also do prefix queries. So give me everything in this directory, essentially, is what we can do. Right? So in, in essence, we're really just having this um, directory structure, more or less, where people can say, I only care about these five directories and this span of time written by these people. And what I want to say next. Yes, I, I claimed that these are useful for a partial sync because uh, right now I, I'm just saying, okay, well, we use these to do essentially queries. We describe the pizza slices that we're interested in. And I've, I've claimed that this somehow works nicely with this range-based set reconciliation approach. And to... I'm not going to go into the details how, but the basic idea is that, um, remember this tree that counted how much stuff we had in a one-dimensional range? You can essentially also place three-dimensional trees on, the, on data that you record in this three-dimensional data space. And then in that three-dimensional tree, you still have the count of stuff, or rather than the count, you have the XOR of a bunch of hashes. And to be truthful, rather than the XOR, you have something that's more secure than XOR. But still, you get the idea. And this, allow, this allows us, this tree allows us to say that for an arbitrary um, pizza slice, we can work out the hash for everything in that pizza slice efficiently from this one single tree. So we don't have to recompute an index depending on the query. We just have the one index that allows us to handle all the queries. That's quite nice. I don't know if it makes sense for us to actually address a question that's just coming from the chat, which was yeah. um, from Connor. Have you seen it? I, I kind of also want to do that. Yes. Okay. Let, let's just address it. Why not? Yeah. Um, it depends on, so what you uh, could do. Let's just repeat the question. So the question is, yeah. so path implies a nested hierarchy, meaning we can't do tag-based queries, such as all items tagged with cat. Yes, and there's the there's two answers to that. So, so the the first superficial answer is well, you can put all your cat pictures in slash cat and all your dog pictures in slash dog, and you're happy. But what you cannot do is you cannot really ask for everything that's tagged with cat and every, and that is also tagged with with dog. I don't know. I'm not creative, right? Because at, at that point, um, you lose that. And this is ultimately a question of dimensionality. Um, let me try to find words for that that make sense. Every, if you just asked for all the cat stuff, that's like saying, well, the path should, everything with the path that starts with cat exclusive and ends with cat exclusive, uh, inclusive, sorry, inclusive both times. And 
you can also ask for all the dogs and then you can, can combine two of these to ask for the cats and the dogs but uh, asking for those uh, pictures that have both cats and dogs you can't express those anymore but imagine instead if we had instead of having time subspace and path we had time subspace and the cat dimension which is either zero or one depending on whether the item is a cat or not and then we could also have a dog dimension which is zero or one right and that way we could easily design a less general purpose uh, model that allows for highly efficient but very specialized queries right so the the dog cat space is a two-dimensional space which we cannot support because to the application developers we only expose this one dimension of path that they really have control over i i think uh, in some ways, for me, uh, this this very much brings up um, the sort of um, uh, free tagging versus other things or attributes or dimensions, depending on how you think about it, right? So I think probably more helpful thing is like we have slash photos. How would we slice cats and dogs under that space? Um, is there is there a tag dimension? that can contain things. Something that we've discussed before um, and which we'd like to work on in the future is good APIs for indexing, essentially, yeah. where each where each index is actually kind of a peer that is able yes. to partially sync with with the full with the full namespace um, and is able to efficiently just say where well, okay, this is where the stuff I'm interested in is and I'm going to sort of work through it and create an index that you can then query. Materialized view, view maintenance. I am mm -hmm. not the person to dive into this, but but sort of in that direction. Yes, sort of in that direction, but trying to make it not live in a single centralized database, but make it yeah. more collaborative. And that turns out to be tricky, particularly if you want uh, transactions and transactional guarantees. There's a lot of literature on that that we cannot go into right Awesome. Yeah. Before we return to the talk, two more mm -hmm. cat dog things. So, <laughs> so first, this is indeed the main restriction of Widow. So we're taking this compromise between um, efficiency, which means few dimensions, and expressivity, which would mean many dimensions. Because the thing is, if you have 20 dimensions, everything becomes very horrible very quickly. Three dimensions already means that the data structures start to become hairy, but three is kind of fine, right? but adding more expressivity here would make a lot of things less um, efficient. Whereas with this one, it's quite difficult to shoot yourself in the foot. So Willow is in some sense really just an experiment in whether this is expressive enough to allow for meaningful um, applications developed on top of it. Or another way of phrasing it is, this is the most expressivity we can offer while feeling confident that we can deliver a sufficiently good performance. And finally, there's another thing in the chat, which was, so if I start cat dog, I'd need a copy under cats and another copy under dogs. That is indeed one way of doing it, yes. And then there's the ridiculous way of storing it under C, D, A, O, T, G, which would be the letters of cat and dog interleaved. That goes into fun territory. Uh, the mathematical background to that is something called a Z-ordered curve which you can use to to kind of compress high dimensional space into a single dimensional space. You lose some properties, but you get surprisingly far. So if you're interested in that, just search the web for a Z order curve, or there's data structures, there's the UB tree. So letter U, letter B tree. And there is literature on that, which is something I probably will say a lot today. <laughs> Uh, always the tension between literature and running implemented systems with the properties that we would like them to have. Yeah, we're trying to grip to bridge there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we? Shall we continue on to deletion? We want to be able to delete stuff, right? Um, people quite rightly want to be able to delete data. Uh, it could be something that they regret sharing. It could be something which put them in danger. This is the expectation that we have, is that we have some 
you know, there is some right to be forgotten, essentially. But deletion is very hard in distributed systems. Let's say we've got some data that we regret sharing, right? Um, and we want to delete it. The issue is, to oft oftentimes to delete this data, we need to keep around some identifying information about the data which was deleted. But this identifying information, this metadata, can often disclose quite a lot of information itself about what was said. You know, who said it, some hints about what it was about, when it was said, possibly. Um, and yeah, so this, this kind of data could be dangerous in the wrong hands. Uh, my slides are in the wrong order. Let's go over that. So we need to be prepared for increasingly authoritarian behavior from governments. Uh, it's not just China, from Australia, the EU, the UK. We've seen many proposals for being able to intercept um, and inspect encrypted user data somehow. And P2P systems are not safe just because this legislation is targeted at traditional centralized services. In fact, P2P systems are more in danger because there's no traditional um, organization to have to deal with through legislature, legislature first, right? Um, somebody can come along, join a swarm, hoover up all the information and, and go on their merry way and process that data. Um, so leaving behind data as little data as possible is, is really critical for us. Um, and we have an exciting new way of, uh, of sort of ratcheting that a little bit further in distributed systems. Do I get to say the exciting things? Yes, you get to say the exciting things. Nice. Because from what I've told you so far, we don't have deletion at all, right? We just said we everybody just puts stuff in sets and we reconcile those sets. So there's an ever-growing mass of data and everything is horrible because ever-growing masses of data are not nice. So we're, I'm going to take you through two steps here. First, we, we eliminate this ever-growing stuff and then we remove the I hate my boss metadata. So first step, how do we build something where entry, where some data overrides other data on top of this um, set reconciliation on this union of data? How can we do that? And the idea is basically that we're going to build uh, something like a key value store. In a key value store, you essentially uh, enter not individual values, but entries. And an entry is a pair of a key and a value. And whenever you insert two entries, they might have different values that have the same key, then only one of them can win. And if we are programming against a key value store API, that's very simple. The, the last write you did wins. And we're going to do a similar thing. So instead of um, just having arbitrary data entries, we have arbitrary data entries with a key. And that key is exactly the path dimension we already talked about. So you can write data under any path. And if there already was data under that path, then the new thing wins and the old thing gets deleted. The problem here is, of course, that in a partition tolerant distributed system, talking about the new thing as if that was a real concept that you could rely on is not true. So you need to find some sort of solution to that. There's keep hashes between uh, things and everything that existed while writing them so that there's this enforced causal order being recorded. That doesn't really help because if two people in two different sides of the partition write stuff at the same time, none of them will point to the other as having happened before the other. So that doesn't really solve the problem. And the next solution would, would be to just choose an arbitrary tiebreaker, like, I don't know, hashing both things and taking the lower hash value. But that's very unpredictable for people. So for Willow, we're taking a very pragmatic compromise. And that is, we're not actually storing entries of a key and a value, so of a path and then arbitrary data, but we're storing timestamped entries. So we're actually attaching a 64-bit timestamp to everything that we write. And then 
the thing with the newest timestamp wins and only in the unlikely event that two people use the same timestamp, then do we use hash-based tie-breaking to make sure that we are con uh, eventually consistent even in case of those ties. So I don't want to go into too many details uh, of the horrors of relying on timestamps. Uh, I just want to quickly point out that if you design a system like that, you should very much assume that those are going to be chosen adversarially. Right? So we have the hash tie breaking in the worst case if people just try to make that thing win by using the lowest timestamp. So nothing really breaks. And people who build applications on top of this should um, keep this in mind. So if, a, if an application UI, I don't know, a Twitter clone has a timeline, if it just posted things with the highest timestamp always uh, at the very front. I guess what people are going to do. So you should keep that in mind. But, but we still have that as a very sensible tiebreaker because if people are not malicious, then this is quite good because clock drift exists, but fairly small. Like if I as a human am able to perceive that something happened after another thing, then all, also my clock drifty devices will probably still order it that way, right? So in particular, if, if I am just writing to my own data store, I rem remember we have this uh, subspace dimension with, which is essentially author. So, we, so I, I only, only the, the data, my data can only conflict with my own data, right? If I write, write something to slash cats, that doesn't delete all the other cats in the world, it just deletes, deletes my old cats. Right. And if I do that for mul multiple devices, I'm probably fine. And I'm probably not going to cheat myself through that. Well, clock drift was, um, was my brain deciding which version I want to keep all along. Sure. <laughs> if, if you want to see it that way, then yes. I, I don't want to be overly defensive uh, about our timestamps either. It's just we have them. We are aware of the limitations. We have a page dedicated on our specification page that's called Timestamps Really, where we go into a lot more arguments for and against <laughs> them. So you feel free to check that out. But yeah, so we have timestamps. We use these for tie breaking. And that's basically, that's how we delete stuff. So everything written to the same subspace, which again, at this moment, just means written by the same person. Um, if it has the same path as something else, that other thing gets deleted and overwritten by the new content. So this is somewhat good, but it doesn't solve the I hate my boss problem, right? In Grill's image there, it's called the ID, but for Willow, that would actually be the path. Right? And if I overwrite the contents of I hate my boss from he's unstylish to, well, they're kind of okay, then my boss is still going to see that I wrote something under I hate my boss. Not good. So the way we are solving this is by going a bit beyond the idea of a key value store. In the traditional key value store, you say if, we have, if there are two conflicting entries and conflicting means um, they have the same key, then only one of them can survive. And we're going to use a different notion of conflicting. We're going to say that um, two paths are conflicting if one of them is a prefix of the other. So for example, the path that only cons uh, consists of a single capital I, that's very much a, a prefix of the string, I hate my boss. So whenever I write something to capital I with a larger timestamp than the thing that where I said that my boss was unstylish, that would delete the unstylish boss. And the nice thing is that I only need to keep this record of I wrote something uh, under the path capital I. That's all I need to keep around. And if later some straggler connects to the network and there's some other data that on paths that starts that start with an I, that will also get deleted. So I don't need to explicitly track which things I deleted. I can just lead a bunch of stuff under a bunch of paths with a single and hopefully less uh, incriminating prefix. Downside is, of course, you need to somewhat design for that. Right? You, you cannot delete 
arbitrary groups of entries. Like you cannot later say, well, my paths have nothing to do with cats, but I want to delete all the cats. That doesn't work. You, you need to first say, okay, I'm posting my cats under slash cats, and then I can delete. Then I just write something to slash cat, and it will delete all the slash cat, slash my favorite cat, slash cat, slash Garfield, and so on. What if your cats and dogs are Z ordered? Good luck. Mm. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. There's a longer answer. Let's not do that right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, then let's move on to the, the last the last important thing that we wanted to do. With... Oh, there is one oh, no. very important question in the chat. I meant to talk about this explicitly. So in the chat, um, that's the question. Question about peer-to-peer -peer and delete. Is this assuming there is no not a malicious peer? Delete should not be possible in a trustless distributed system. Yes, absolutely correct. I should have prefaced everything with this. If my peer takes a screenshot of me hating my boss, my protocol is not going to go to their house and tear down their fridge. So, so all we are trying to do is we're trying to say that peers that do want to collaborate on this should be able to do so. They should not be forced to store incriminating metadata just because the protocol forces them to, which would be a classic problem with something like Scatterbot, where you have to keep this hash chain. And then later you can always prove, well, but they said something that had this hash. And then, yeah, they had to keep that information. All right. OK. So the last, the last thing we wanted to have in the protocol. No more questions. All right. So access control. Um, this one doesn't really need much explaining. Not all data is public. Does and access. Well, I don't have a cover slide for this one. I forgot. Ah, I see. Okay, sorry. Don't, please don't. Putting over the on the slide. Don't make it so sure. obvious. Um, and access isn't either on or off. Uh, there's a spectrum of trust, right? And it, and it can be quite arbitrary as well. And we've taken some unique ideas from Ersta and we've improved upon them substantially. So the main idea that we've taken from Ersta is that of namespaces. We don't assume all the data in the world belongs in one pot. Instead, you can separate out into totally independent universes of data called namespaces for all the important areas of your life as displayed here. Um, and every everybody using Willow gets this system at, at least. But we've also added um, we we now have a optional capability system on top of Willow as well, which we call MeadowCap. Uh, MeadowCap cap, 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 capability. It's also a mushroom name. It's it's nice. It works. Um, and so, so far we've been talking about things in a very like ID centric way, but we want to use a capability um, system instead. And so instead of an author per entry, we have subspaces instead. Um, and caps can grant access to those. So we have this kind of like 3D model here where a capability, um, you have a source capability, which would represent the blue cube here, sort of like everything inside of this namespace. And then you can restrict these capabilities further into smaller, um, to smaller regions of this namespace as well to to separate users. Um, and we also have this kind of like this concept of two different kinds of namespaces as well, um, which is the the communal namespace and the owned namespace. And these have different, um, yeah, kind of like different ideas of, of permission to them. So the communal version, anybody who knows about the namespace address of a communal namespace can join, can claim, can kind of like join that namespace, write data into it with their own subspace, and nobody needs to grant them permission first. And nobody can revoke that permission from them either. Nobody can take that away from them. Um, and then we also have the owned namespace where there is a, a single kind of like somebody, like for example, somebody generates a single key pair, which 
um, which kind of like represents the ultimate authority over that namespace. And then they they hand out capabilities to other people, um, probably restricted ones, that give them access to some part of that namespace. But 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 the owner has ultimate control over that kind of namespace. Blogging versus social networks is uh, an example yeah. that I sometimes use, right? So yeah. um, blogging is my house. If you have a comment that I don't like, I'm going to nuke it. I might add other people to edit or have other capabilities in there. Whereas quotation marks a social network is a shared space. And obviously what we're working on in distributed systems is that you're you're re removing the fact that social networks are someone's house as well in classic web two platforms where uh, uh, they don't quite have that attribute of no one can be kicked out. If that's helpful. It is, it is helpful. Um, I think another, you know, like I, I think another useful way of talking about it is, you know, kind of like if you have a namespace that for stuff that you have, for data that you are liable for essentially, like imagine you are, um, you are researching, you are building kind of like a private archive and you have responsibility and for what appears inside of that namespace. Um, you want, you want an owned namespace, you know, you don't want anybody to be able to join your private, uh, you know, company namespace. Um, but the, of course, the, the drawback of the owned namespace is at any point, the owner could say, I'm deleting everything here and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so you want to make sure that you have owners who you have faith in, I guess. Whereas you don't need that for the communal namespace because um, it's anything goes. But over there, you need much stronger moderation tools. You need to be able to block people. Um, you need to be able to say, I'm interested in these people as well because it's a possibly infinite space. Filter out all the cat dogs that you absolutely don't want to see. Exactly. I look forward to future iterations of this talk where we have illustrations of the mythical cat dog. Or the, the Zed ordered sliced up cat dog where the, <laughs> the heads, yeah. Um, Alyosha, what do you think? Does that, have I covered, have I covered namespaces in Meadow Cap? Uh, what am I missing there? That sounds good. Okay, fantastic. Um, in that case, I will end the, the formal part of the presentation here with a slide of how EarthStars synchronization used to work, um, which was just shoot everything at each other um, until you're all set up. Who cares if you've got it all before? Um, and I guess, yeah, now we can do we can do questions. Or I think, Ayoshi, you also wanted to maybe talk about other paths considered but not taken. Depends on the volume of questions. I all right. Let's Amazing. Do let's do a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic to get an overview. Thank you so much, you two. That's great. Um, uh, questions. Uh, I will ask something about, um, so I use blogging and social networks as sort of, uh, examples of, to illustrate one of those things there. And you've talked a little bit about application developers and application level dis uh, concerns. Can you maybe talk a little bit about um, essentially like what is, um, uh, and actually we should probably stop the screen share because then we'll get, um, yeah. full video of us, uh, uh, doing that. If you want to do that. Amazing. Um, can you talk a little bit about like earth star, like literally what is it, what you're trying to do? And obviously you illustrated the sync procedure that you're trying to solve and maybe a little bit about, um, what other applications you see emerging or hope to see built on Willow? Sure. I guess one, one major piece of context that's missing from this is Willow protocol is what's going to power the next version of Earthstar. Um, it's a formalization and more efficient version and more featureful version of what Earthstar used to, was, was able to do. Um, and so we're going to kind of like Willow um, it doesn't have any opinions about the hash function that you use or the signature scheme 
that you use or what paths should look like. That is sort of something that you layer on yourself on top there. So Earthstar will come to that with kind of like web, web browser friendly APIs, you know, like the hash will be SHA-256. Um, the, the signature scene will be ED25519, right? Um, and there'll be file system like paths, for instance. Amazing. Um, I'll actually just ask for a little more expansion there. So just to mm. spell it out for the video as well. So really, this path has been secure subtle, scuttlebutt, SSB, Earthstar to go, oh, there's um, challenges with the SSB protocol. Yeah. And now, as you said, Willow is the formalization of some of these things that you can build Earthstar v next with. And uh, uh, that point about being very in web browser friendly, Obviously, for those that don't know, we've been talking to uh, Gwil about some of the stuff that Fission is doing because we very much leaned into, let's try and make all of this work in browsers. ED25519 is one of the things that we didn't have four years ago. Mm. Uh, um, um, so it's great. You know, I'm so excited that we have these new tools in the, in the browser environment. Um, can you actually uh, also, like, essentially for the record is, what is Earthstar? Um, it's supposed to be kind of like, I, I, I think I came to it a few years ago with a feeling of, well, I was exploring all these different decentralized protocols and seeing, and I wanted to build React apps with them, you know, like chat apps, little little things, and you have to store some data somewhere. Um, and while working with these things, this feeling of kind of like, oh, hey, if this was done right, this could actually be easier than setting up this whole, you know, talking to Firebase, or whatever, and have, and have you know far more benefits. But at the time, the the kind of like the developer facing APIs had a lot to be desired in this regard, and many of them did not work in browsers at all. And so, Earthstar was very much a conscious attempt to make a very user friendly, um, you know, a simple storage API um, that synced between between servers, essentially like relay servers, a little bit like Nosta does that, I suppose. Amazing! Um, That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Connor, feel free to unmute if you'd like to ask your question. I'll technically move in the chat. Yep, and I will start my video too. Um, so I'm building a distributed app and I just found out about it, um, Willow, but I've also been considering WNFS and OrbitDB and PureBit and hollow chain and there's uh, so many different <laughs> options here um, um right now i've just been using orbit db since it's ready um but uh one thing and then and then i i might um switch to pure bit which is a newer fork because it it uh, does something really well which is let you spin up um, as many databases as you want. It's not very uh, costly to have lots of databases rather than just one that gets synced. And the the benefit of that is to make um, one topic be a database. So if it's a social network, um, one post can be one database. So then only the, the peers who are interested in that post, all the comments and everything are in there and it just syncs that. Um, so with with this protocol, um, I see how the path works and uh, basically how, how do you do topics? Uh, is, is it uh, something, is it cheap to, to have multiple databases? You'd obviously have a whole nother tree for each one. Is it recommended to put everything in one, um, you know, sharing with people revoking access to an entire topic that kind of thing yeah i think the intention is to use sort of like a, a single namespace and then to use the tools that we have at hand which are paths and subspaces subspaces are very specifically not named authors um because we want them to be able to be rep they want we want them to be able to represent different semantics so for example a git repository could be in a subspace and then Whoever created that can grant other people right access to that subspace effectively. Suddenly you collaboratively maintain a Git repository, still using the same data model as before, which is quite nice. Right? And then it's essentially everything you can sensibly model uh, in the file system API. Right? You, 
you can just think of our paths as um, as files as as paths in the file system, and it's it's fairly accurate. Like you will you will not get hurt if you do that. Oh no, Mo is going to leave. Um, are we dog fooding right now, Mo? No, we are not dog fooding yet, but we plan to soon. We have funding for implementing this right now, and um, once we have a work implementation, we will dog food. Are they gone already? Okay, we we have it on the recording. Yeah, it's good. We do. We have yeah. It. <laughs> um. Yeah, I I think if we're talking about specific communities at this point, um. Well, I mean, I'm getting specific... I'm getting strong. Uh, like I I would would you call yourself part of local first? Definitely. Um, but also I I think it's you know like, um, Iro. The sort of IPFS reimagining, they have a lot of interest in Willow and they're adopting the data model, um, at least for, for IRO. Um, so whichever communities they are targeting are also now the communities that, that Willow are targeting as well. Um, but on a personal level, um, Urstar at least is featured kind of like on a very sort of intimate level in my day-to-day -day life. Like for instance, my 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 daily use of Urstar is an app, a small app that I wrote to save funny stuff um, that our kid says, um, and that has been you know running for a few years, um, just between my wife and I, and sometimes the the server that powers that breaks or, you know, like I, I forgot to update the, the payment details for it and everything keeps working. Um, and I never get any emails from anybody that says like, our API is changing or you need to, you need to take action to upgrade your application or anything like that. Um, and that'll be one of the first things that I'll be updating uh, once I've got to that point with the Willow.js implementation, which I've been working on for a while now. Awesome. Take off. Hey, um, so thanks for the talk. That was really nice to hear the um, set reconciliation. Um, so thinking about partial sync and the set reconciliation algorithm that you just um, talked about, how would I use that in JavaScript today? Hmm. Um, I made a small library called Range Reconcile last year, um, which Urstar uses currently. It has some caveats to it. For instance, the sort of the data structure that it uses to efficiently calculate fingerprints is all in memory and needs to be built from scratch. Essentially, every time uh, you you forget it, I suppose. Um, but yeah, that that's uh, if you want to use that, that is very that is a very generic library as well, and you can bring your own transport, your own fingerprint um, monoid to it, your own encodings to it, everything like that. So that's where I would start if you wanted to use that in JS. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I want to pull up actually a couple of other uh, uh, things. I think they're talking about. Um, we model things as file paths. Uh, that's obviously the direction um, that Fission has leaned into with WinFS. Uh, and we spent some time looking at things like uh, solid and um, remote storage, which is an ITF draft. Um, and uh, I personally think that, um, you know, for good or ill, uh, people, users can still wrap their head around file systems to a certain degree. Um, are you thinking about that as a developer facing uh, abstraction, a user facing abstraction? How do we feel about file paths? File, file paths are very much an earth star thing. Um, in Willow, paths are byte strings. Um, so it's, you know, they're very free form. And you can define how they, you know, like there's no there's no concept of path segments or directories or anything like that. It's completely conceptual. Right. So you you can uh, at the application layer you could treat it like that, but you have the flexibility to do it lots of other ways underneath. Right. And Philip, you should ask that out loud, please. Uh, it's basically just a more of a conceptual kind of 
thing, which is still very abstract. I need to wrap my head around exactly what the data structure looks like. Uh, but essentially just hearing, well, it's all set based and then hearing, well, all we need is an associative binary operation was surprising to me. I was expecting that there, that the binary operation that constructs a fingerprint would need to be commutative as well. And the, the answer to that is that in the one dimensional case, we have all this conceptually unordered data, but we store it in a set, like we store it in a tree, which we can traverse in ascending order. And that's how we apply the function. Right. So with um, the example I used of counting things, that's not very instructive because counting things is of course commutative. But if it was matrix multiplication, for example, then the same tree would still work because you always, where you always compute things from left to right. right? You, you just say that, call this function with the left subtree first and the right subtree second. And the same items will always be to the right of other items because sorting doesn't change. Okay. But in the multidimensional setting, we don't have that anymore. If we have a multidimensional tree, right, there is no single natural total order on a, a two in, of points in a two-dimensional space, for example. You can define one. Right. You can just sort them lexicographically, for example, so order by one dimension first, and in case of a tie, use the second dimension. But that does not give you an efficient uh, data structure for multidimensional queries. So the, the efficient data structures there, they cannot rely on um, two points being sorted in the same way always. So for the multidimensional setting, we do require commutativity of the function for combining uh, set fingerprints. All right, yeah, perfect, that makes sense. Like in the one-dimensional case, basically you're sorting in, in, in advance. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do we have any final questions? Amazing. Uh, thank you again for presenting. That was super great. Um, love the hand-drawn imagery. Uh, my mind is very full and I need to go back for a bunch of these other links. I've dropped a link and we'll share uh, um, a link to the uh, Willow development channel in the Earthstar Discord. Uh, are, is there anything else that you you want from people uh, 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 or, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, things we can help share? There is a fun thing I would also like to, to share, which is recent enough to not have made it into the prepared part of the talk which is end-to-end -end encryption, which apparently some people like. And <laughs> we thought for a long time that, no, not really compatible with this model of supplying three-dimensional ranges and then doing arbitrary queries for that. Because if you encrypt stuff, the ordering gets scrambled. So you cannot really do, you cannot encrypt paths and then, and then expect sensible path range queries. But what we figured out is that if we restrict the queries that you do to prefix-based queries. So just give me everything that starts with slash cat, for example. There do exist, um, there do exist prefix preserving encryption algorithms. So in that sense, if we restricted the expressivity of Willow a bit, so, so in particular, we would restrict the mechanism by which capabilities can delimit sub areas, we would restrict that to being prefix based rather than path range based. And also the, the, the pizza slices you supply for partial sync, you would also restrict those. Then you could do end to end encryption on the user level, where just before you put data into Willow, you just uh, run it through a prefix preserving encryption function, which is pretty damn exciting. So we are very strongly considering to to take this reduced um, expressivity, which still leaves us at, still leaves us at the same expressivity as file systems, for example, where you, right, your Unix toolkit doesn't really delete stuff by file by path range. It also only is glob based, which is prefix based. Right, so it still seems like a very powerful and sensible API, but it would give us end-to-end -end encryption. Now we're in this ridiculous position where we have specified things based on, um, on ranges on paths. And we want to remove that feature, but we also need to publish the stuff to unlock the funding. 
So essentially, we're trying to get some more time to remove a feature. So if anyone would be willing to fund us to delay our product um, by making it less featureful, or in other words, if anyone would be interested in funding us to bring end-to-end -end encryption to Willow, then please reach out. That's awesome. Uh, and what we'll do is I will, uh, first I will um, hit the stop recording button. So goodbye video people. <laughs>